Okay, I'm going to go through two examples of calculating value at risk, or VAR. And VAR is a statistical measurement of downside risk applied to a current portfolio. And it assumes that there are going to be no changes in positions over the time horizon being considered. VAR can be calculated for any time period you want, but since uncertainty increases as time passes, you will typically see VARs calculated for single days or maybe one trading week or maybe a month. So there's two major methods of calculating VAR. Uh, the first is non-parametric, where we just look at historical data, historical volatility in a portfolio, and we assume that going forward the portfolio is going to behave in a similar manner. The other method is parametric where we use a theoretical probability distribution like the normal distribution to approximate how the portfolio can move. Parametric is what I'm going to be covering here. You need a few values to calculate VAR, and I've already mentioned that you need the current portfolio value. You also need a measurement of the expected volatility, and we're going to adjust that for the time horizon. The volatility we're going to be looking at is an annualized volatility then we'll adjust it for the time horizon. And then you need a confidence level. So this confidence level is something that's generally pretty close to one, but it can't be one because that would represent we have absolute certainty that losses will not exceed some value. And since we can't be absolutely certain, we usually settle for something pretty close to one. 95 and 99% confidence levels are what are typically seen. The big problem with VAR is we don't know what happens once we exceed our confidence level. So, for example, a 99% confidence level means that the portfolio had a negative 2.33 standard deviation move. In general, on a daily basis, we can expect the move to be around zero. Now we're saying that, oh, it went down 2.33 standard deviations below that expected level. And then, well, what happens when it gets beyond that? We can't be sure the loss can get much larger than what we're going to be calculating here. And it's important to kind of note that when we calculate VAR in this way, we're really calculating an average VAR. All right, so what would happen if we had this negative 2.33 standard deviation move on average? Okay, so with that preamble, we'll go ahead and jump into our spreadsheet. Okay, so as mentioned, we need these several values before we can go ahead and calculate our VAR. So we're just going to make up a portfolio position of a million dollars. We are going to be looking at, in this example, uh, Apple. All right, and so I went ahead and calculated the standard deviation for Apple, and I based it on movements uh, in the stock for the last year. So we can see it's about 30.5. All right, so I'll just plug that in here. And we'll assume we're going to go forward uh, one trading week, so five days. And again, we'll go ahead and assume this 99% confidence level. Okay, so next I'm just going to calculate uh, that standard deviation based on the normal uh, probability distribution. Uh, how far away from the mean is 99%? And to do that, I'm going to use the norms inverse function. And then I can just point at the 99% confidence level. And as I mentioned earlier, it's going to be 2.33 standard deviations. Okay, it's really negative 2.33 standard deviations, but we want our VAR as a positive number, not a negative number. All right, so with that, we can just go ahead and calculate VAR as the portfolio value times this confidence level times the volatility, all right, and then multiplied by the time horizon, which we're going to have to adjust. So we're going to get the square root of that time horizon over however many trading days there are in a year. So without this adjustment, it's going to give you a VAR for one year. Okay, so with those inputs for the next five days, uh, we might expect something as bad as about $100,000 uh, as a worst case scenario. We can adjust this a little bit. A one day VAR, about 45,000. Okay, a two week VAR, 141,000 and a one-month VAR, uh, 
uh, about 20% of the portfolio. Okay, so I mentioned it's a 99% confidence level and I don't know how bad it can get if I get beyond this 99% confidence level. But if you consider 252 trading days in a year, uh, that covers uh, about 249 of them. All right, so that's a very simple example where we have a single security in our portfolio. And what happens when we have more than one security? The calculation gets somewhat more complex because now we have weights, and now we have securities that may have a tendency to move together, and then that means the volatility will be quite a bit different. So we need a couple other uh, measurements before we can calculate VAR here. Uh, the first thing we're gonna do is go ahead and uh, I'll just make up some weights. So we're gonna have a two security portfolio here, uh, multiple securities, uh, the calculation for the expected volatility gets pretty long. So I'm just using two securities and then to add a third, say, uh, I'll explain how to uh, get the correct volatility for that one too. All right, so I'll just say we're gonna go with a 90% Apple, 10% Gold, and then I'll go ahead and look at the data quickly. So what we did was calculate the daily change for each security, and based on that, I calculated a variance. Okay, so the variance uh, is a daily variance, and then to get a full year variance, I have to multiply it by the number of trading days, 252, and there's actually 252 measurements here. Okay, did the same thing for Apple, and then uh, to get the standard deviation, okay, I just took the square root of the variance in both cases. All right, and then I calculated the covariance. And again, uh, we're calculating a single day covariance, so I'm gonna have to multiply that by 252 to get the full year. With those preliminary calculations out of the way, we can go ahead and calculate our portfolio expected volatility as an annualized rate. And it's gonna be the square root of the weight of Apple squared times the variance of Apple, and I went ahead and named some of these cells so I wouldn't have to switch between sheets. We're gonna to add to that the weight of gold squared times its variance. And then since these securities may have a tendency to move together or not move together in this case, we're gonna add two times the covariance, which again, I named, adjusted for the weights, again, of Apple and of gold. Okay, so we can see that by diversifying our portfolio a little bit, adding 10% gold, we have reduced our overall risk by about 10%. The variance of Apple or the standard deviation of Apple by itself was just over 30%. After that, the calculation for value at risk is the same. So I've pre-populated some of these values and then we'll just go ahead and calculate our VAR again. And it's gonna be the portfolio value times our confidence level times our portfolio volatility adjusted for the time. Okay, so we can see the value at risk there is 184,270. Comparing it to the single security VAR, uh, we can see that it reduced it by just about 20,000 or close to 10%. And then we can sort of play around with the weights a little bit and see what that does to value at risk. All right, and I guess a 50% portfolio would almost cut the value at risk in half. Okay, so that's a two security value at risk. And if we wanted to add another security, well, the calculation for the expected volatility just becomes quite a bit more complex. So in addition to this covariance adjustment that we have, we're gonna to have to add a term for the third security in here. So there's gonna be a covariance for security one and three and security two and three. And those are both gonna to have to be also adjusted for the weights. So when you have a portfolio with 10 or more securities, this calculation for portfolio volatility is gonna get quite involved. After that, value at risk is a pretty straightforward calculation. So I hope that helps getting started with value at risk.